We are delighted that for the second year, Gate to Lease has honored us, I think in many ways helped us make the transition from Neiman across the river and bring the conference back over here to Boston University by having Gay so generously agree to come. He spoke last year. Uh, uh, it was one of the high points, I think, of my life to have the chance to get to meet him and chat with him. And uh, I learned last year that if you're going to introduce him, it'll do you no good to try to dress up as nicely as he does because you'll always suffer by comparison. So this year I even decided no necktie, I'll just come and uh, introduce Gay. We're really delighted to, uh, to have him and uh, I would just uh, like you to honor Gay Talese with a warm welcome. I thank you very much, and I'm going to begin by honoring Tom Fiedler, the Dean of Communications. He and his, his colleagues, all of them, or many of them you've met personally, and some of them are working behind the scenes. I think this has been a wonderful program, and I want to thank you, Tom, and all those people who are in your communications department for the great assemblage of uh, pat my fellow panelists and, and the people you've drawn. And I hope that um, <clears throat> you've gained something from this, this long uh, uh, ses a series of sessions. I am also going to, um, in deference to the time and, 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 the, and, the, and the restrictions you've had to confront. After all, you've been here in the same room as I have since about 9 o'clock. And what I think I would like to do is alter what had been on my mind to speak to you to listening to you. One of the things last year when I was here, as Tom mentioned, I left feeling I hadn't heard enough. I didn't get enough feedback because I didn't have enough time. In fact, none of us have enough time. And what I'd like to do, uh, after briefly introducing myself to those of you who I've not addressed before, who've never met me and know next to nothing about me, I'd like to say just a few things, but I don't want to go into any detail at any length, because I would like to turn this uh, time I have, with Isabel's per, uh, permission, um, to, to hearing questions that might give us an opportunity to address things that have not been. Uh, I myself, having when Susan was here and others were here, and Jill Abramson, they said things that I prepared to say myself, and I found my my own imagined speech being nibbled away at by previous speakers. So I would like to, um, to merely say a few things, and then I'd like to open it up so that we can bring out uh, information or responses to some of your curious uh, notions or some of the real serious questions you have about where you are and what you want to do with what you're working on. Maybe those. Subjects can be brought up and we'll have that time for that rather than hearing me ramble on. Um, I merely want to say that at, at, you've heard me say I'm 79 now and I've started working as a published um, uh, journalist in my hometown weekly when I was 17 and 16. In fact, we're going to go to a reading, as you know, if you follow the program, and I'll probably read something very briefly that I wrote when I was younger than people in this room, when I was 18 or 19. Because when I was 18 or 19, I wasn't so different, except physically, from what I am today. Much has been mentioned uh, of the magazine pieces I've written, principally when Jill Abramson was up here, she even had a flash on our screen of the of the outline I wrote for the Frank Sinatra piece called Frank Sinatra has a cold. I was 32 years old. That was in 1965 I was doing that. And I, um, less than four or five months ago, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker about a singer, not, not a pop singer like Frank Sinatra, but an opera singer, a, a, um, a Russian soprano named Marina Popovskaya. And I realized after I finished that piece, it was published in the December issue of The New Yorker, that I went about that piece on this opera singer the same way I had done 40 some years before the Sinatra uh, subject. And what's, what essentially I do and have always done, and even when I was a 
high school kid contributing to the town weekly when I wrote about my fellow students on a weekly basis. I, I just hang around. It's not so, nothing so structured, nothing so um, remarkable that any of you could do, uh, anybody can do it. It's just hanging around and getting to be, to get, to get the permission, sometimes un unstated, of people to allow you to hang around. How do you do that? I mean, much is made about investigative reporting and, and getting the story and being persistent and, being, and persevering. There are other things that are a factor in giving you that wonderful opportunity to be close to strangers and to make them less estranged and less estranged as you get to know them and they get to know you. There's a, it's a courtship. But how do you get to the position where you can court someone? There's something that I think journalism classes do not teach, and I don't think it's been stressed at all this, in our many occasions to do that during the hours you've spent in this room and yesterday elsewhere. There's something about politeness, something about traditional good manners that's very essential in all forms of journalism or nonfiction of magazine reporting. It makes no difference. It's how to treat people, how to introduce yourself to people, how to comport yourself, how to behave properly. Um, I know that there's no general explanation or, or nor um, am I in a position to tell you anything except what works for me and what has worked for me for the better part of six, almost six decades of doing it. And just very briefly, my advantage as a young man was to have been <clears throat> the son of a mother and father who ran a store. I'm a son of shopkeepers. I grew up really in a store, not in a house, not in an apartment so much as in a store because my parents are always in the store. My mother was the more successful in a commercial sense of the two people. My father was a very fine but not successful commercial tailor. Made beautiful suits that took him too long to make and make any money because not many people would pay for the time it took him to make the suits. It's something of what we're talking about as writers. There's many writers but spend too much time. So he didn't make a lot of money, but he had a lot of pride in his craft. And I picked up some of that in the way I work as a writer, a researching writer, and the final work of, of polishing my prose. But my mother was the one that allowed us to pay the, pay the rent and, 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 and dine regularly. And she sold dresses. And she was a very fine woman in that she presented herself very attractively in the dresses she chose to wear. She was blessed with attractive features to begin with, slender, and very, very prideful without being pomp pompous. And she dressed well, and she set an example of what a woman, a well-dressed woman could, could find through clothing that would enhance the whole appearance of such a woman. Her customers were, were rather middle-aged and, and, and oftentimes a little overweight. She, my mother specialized in that kind of customer. That kind of customer was the type of woman who ran the social life of the town. They were the affluent women of the men who ran the town the wives of the, of, of the mayor and the, and the council and, and, the, and, the, and the principal of schools and the, the leading Buick dealer and all these people in this little town who were making the money and running the town politically as well as socially had these women who in the afternoon would come to my mother's dress shop on the main street. And my mother, Catherine, would talk to them. Knew, she knew all these women by first name and, and she was deferential. She didn't think she was on any level socially or otherwise, but she was very uh, uh, knowledgeable about what women uh, should wear or what they could wear. And she presented them what she thought was the best choices for them. And they trusted her because she was a good example of that. And they'd talk. They knew Kay and Kay knew them. And they'd talk, and they'd look at the dresses, and they'd talk, and they'd sit around sometimes that they're outside the fitting room. And as I was 10 and 11 at the time, after school, I would come home and help in the shop to the degree that I could, and that meant dusting the counters or getting some of the cardboard, the cartons that, that 
after you bought a dress, you folded the dress and you put it in a carton and tissue paper on that. I would fold the cartons and put the tissue paper in place and anticipate the sale. But I listened to the conversations my mother had with these women, and these women were talking about their lives. It was the wartime 40s, it was, I was, it was during World War II, and it was a small town, far removed from the front. And yet the conversations of these women, having to do with rationing, having to do with perhaps the, the, the anticipation or the anxieties they felt about having a son in the army or maybe a daughter working in a war plant, the, 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 rec the responses to the war, the reverberations of that faraway war in Europe and Asia was still felt and these towns remote from it, and the re-echoings of the concern of these women were felt in this dress shop, were echoed in this dress shop, and I would listen to these stories. And I would listen and listen and think, gee, they're interesting. They're interesting stories. As a journalism student, even then, I didn't think they were newsworthy, because the newspaper, the weekly newspaper I contributed to, and the daily paper, the Atlantic City Press, this was in southern New Jersey where I was born and reared, the, the town t 10 miles away was Atlantic City and it had a daily newspaper. I'd read the Atlantic City Press, mainly for the sports at first, but I'd read the paper. And I realized it wasn't news. What I was hearing were interesting stories that were not news stories. Certainly not in the news of that time. Now that now with Jill Abramson and people, we, we know there's an there's a opening now in journalism for the private story, the, the vignette, the personal story that wasn't necessarily true. When I was young, in my formative period, was more formulaic journalism, the five W's, it had to be news. But these stories that my mother was eliciting as she was a good listener from these women gave me the idea that journalism could maybe, at least I wanted to write about these women or write about the stories or writing about or ordinary people. So this was really my beginning, but what I also learned, as I about to say before, was that appearances do matter. My father and mother dressed well. In the store, they were very uh, always polite to their customers. And it was not entirely for commercial purposes. You have to be polite to customers. You have to be respectful. But what I gained from watching their, their behavior toward their customers, proper behavior, I also was aware of the variety of women who came to the store. They were, they were middle-aged women, and I found myself comfortable with older people. So the store manners that I have were, first of all, based on um, knowing how to treat people with respect, being rather comfortable in the store because there's always people coming and going, coming and going of all ages. Some of them were perspective. Uh, customers from my father, the tailor, some of the men would come in to have suits altered, not to be made, but other suits that he'd made to be altered. So I became aware of customers, and I became aware of the public through the store at first. And so later on, when I left my town, and I was 17 years of age, and I went off to college, and then at college, I was also working for the college newspaper. And then when I left college in 1953 uh, and went to, to New York and got a job as a copy boy, and from there, a reporter, and years and years later, a reporter who also wrote magazine pieces, then being 30, then being 40, then being 50, then being 70 out to nine, as I am today, I realized there's not, a much, there's not much difference in what I ever did. I know how to treat people with respect because that's the store manners that I, was, I grew up with. I think that dressing properly in front of people shows respect for the people. In my case, uh, I'm not preaching fashion here to sell a suit to any of you, but I really want to say that even as a reporter, I thought that you have to dress up for the story. As a young reporter working with the New York Times, which is the only place I work, I thought, I have enormous respect for what I'm doing. I have a lot of respect for the people I'm working with. Many of them were much older than I was. I was 21 when I started at the Times as a copy boy. But I'd see the, in this big city room, a room is about as even larger than this room, even more people than are in this room right now. There are rows and rows and rows of reporters. There were 400 people on the, on the city staff of the New York Times in those days to say nothing of the editors and you know, the copy readers. And, 
all these people around the room. And one time I remember when I was at the paper for about two years, I was just coming into the, to the one o'clock shift. I started at one o'clock in the afternoon. And I remember I came into the third floor, swinging doors, looked out of all these people on typewriters, those days smoking, on the telephone talking. Editors were doing their work on the next day's edition in terms of plotting out the page, et cetera. And I thought to myself, in this room, these 500 people I could see, and just by casting my eye from here to there, there are probably, I thought to myself, probably fewer liars per square yard in this room than anywhere of comparable size in the whole city of New York, and indeed the nation. <laughs> and I was thinking about the liars on Wall Street and the liars in, 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 the, in the law enforcement and the, even the clergy. I mean, all of the people who, who, to whom you don't really fully trust. If you're a good journalist, you know you have to be somewhat, um, not never cynical, but certainly skeptical of what you hear and the information you get. You have to check it out. Which isn't to say that journalists are honest, all of them, because we know references are made just today to uh, Jason Blair and others. But what is also important to know is that when people lie within journalism, as I knew it, they are caught by their own colleagues. There's no cover-up in the journalism that I knew. Sooner or later, you're going to be exposed, as Jason Blair was, not by the police department or the Supreme Court of the United States, just by your fellow journalist. Indeed, in the case of Jason Blair, the two top editors who were responsible for maintaining the integrity of the paper lost their jobs. So many people who are thieves on Wall Street they haven't lost their jobs today. But it, there's that kind of integrity. So that I am proud to be in a business that tries to be honest, doesn't always succeed. But the people try to tell the truth. They try to get to the truth to the people. And as we know, we don't make most of this much money. And that's been said again. You heard that often. But what a way of spending your life, as I have. And in 79, what pride I have in the kind of people who are my colleagues from the very beginning. And I think that's a wonderful way to end your life, to think that you did associate with people for, for whom you have nothing but pride. Um, my, my work, as I said, I take pride in now as I did when I was very, very young. I think, as was said again, that there is, this is not the end of the print media. This is not the end of journalism. This is not the end of magazine writing. It's certainly not the end of narrative nonfiction. I think that this is a great beginning. And this place, this wonderful Boston University, and these wonderful people from Tom on down, are, are in the, they're the apostles of this. This is a, this is a great thing that, that they're doing. And this is a great thing for you to be, to be listening to, to be privy to, to, to engage with uh, us who are here for a brief period of time trying to maintain your interest, as I hope I have. But before I go on and beyond beyond, I said, I want to ask you, what is it that you would like to ask me? And if I can't answer, I'll tell you. But I would like to hear from those of you who are have a question and haven't had a time, haven't had the time to ask it. And moreover, I'm aware, despite the fact of being in this room for so long, when you leave here and go to the next part of our program, you're going to have no opportunity to ask questions. You're going to just be listening to reading. So this is really your last chance <laughs> to, to be heard. And so I would like to ask, if you don't mind, some questions. Oh, just, I wanna, this man first. Just, what's your name? Thomas. Thomas. Uh, you're, you're known as a meticulous reporter and as an elegant writer. So I was just wondering, how did you acquire those skills? Uh, the, the skills that, how did I acquire this so-called skills? Uh, what it is for me, and I was same thing true with Susan Orlean that you heard earlier. She, um, she said, and she could have been speaking for me as well, that fiction was what she read very avidly. And uh, I did start reading short stories. I, I wasn't from a home where there were books. My father, the tailor, was not a, a, a man of literature, to be sure. My mother, while, while very, very skilled in her 
uh, way of speaking to customers also was not a literary woman. So I went at the, at the library in my little town in Ocean City, New Jersey, and later on at the University of Alabama. I would read, I would read the magazines. I would read the New Yorker, which I couldn't get. You couldn't buy the New Yorker in Ocean City, and I never actually never heard of the uh, New Yorker until I went. I hardly heard of the New Yorker until I went to New York. To tell you the truth, when I was a copy boy, so I was 21. But I would read Saturday Evening Post. I read Collier's Magazine. These were mag um, big magazines when I was a kid. And sometimes they'd have short stories that I liked. Sometimes it'd be a famous person, um, um, you know, even even um, um, some New Yorker writers were writing for other magazines when they would probably be writing for what the New Yorker didn't publish would wind up at the Saturday Evening Post or Collier's or the, or some other magazine. I remember one of my favorite, and or Esquire perhaps, one of my favorite writers was a named Irwin Shaw, and another one was John O'Hara. And another was, um, um, well, in short, sometimes I'd buy collections of short stories. And um, what I liked about the short story is I thought, thought if I could learn to, to tell stories, like a short story writer or a novelist, but I didn't have to change, if I knew the characters well enough, I didn't have to change the name. It'd be very interesting. So I thought what I wanted to do, and influenced by the short story writers that I most identified with or aspired to be at least um, I tried to learn from, uh, I wanted to write short stories with real names. Short stories are 4,000 words, 5,000 words or less. They could be, could be 1,000 words and be beautifully crafted short, short story. But I wanted to have real names in there, and that meant that I wanted to do something in nonfiction that wasn't so commonplace in those days. And I've continued to see that the fine fiction writers, there's so many fine fiction writers, and so many fine fiction writers are, 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 are having a tough time being, being published. It's always been true, but they are using their imagination. And what I wanted to do was use the structure of the story, the fictional story, but to, uh, to write intimately about the characters because, uh, through, through research, through taking that extra step and, that, and devoting a, a large amount of time to getting to know people. And if I use dialogue, I wanted to be sure it was right. And I don't use tape recorder. So I have a very developed ear. But not to say as Truman Capote did when he wrote In Cold Blood that he had total recall. I don't have total recall. I do sometimes, when I'm able to be alone for a few minutes, and I had spoken to someone, and I remembered a certain, certain phrase from what they told me, or, or a sense of um, exchange we had, the dialogue we had. I will then go write it in my, these little cards that have been referenced, these little shirt boards. I keep notes. These are boards that, I, as you, it's already been described by other people, but this is just part of a shirt board, like, like this. Is, pretend that's a shirt board. But that comes on the back of a shirt. And I cut it with a scissor, and then I trim it off and, um, and put it in my jacket. And they're hard, and, and I write things, as you see. And I will take a little note, and then I'll put it back in my pocket, and no one will, no one will make a big issue about it. And um, then I go home at night, and I type up what I saw and heard that day. I'm very careful about that. I date it I, when I, I'm doing my, when I'm com going from shirtboard notations to the type typewriter that I still use, incidentally, um, I write the date and I write about not only what I what I was heard, no, not only the research, but what I was thinking while I was doing that, what I was imagining, uh, what I was seeing beyond just the character I was write, interviewing. I I, did, I write little scenes. Uh, it's like a journal. Sometimes it's very private. What I'm writing, maybe it's I'm saying in the margin of what I'm recording as a, an account, I'll say something about my, my wondering whether this is really going to be interesting or whether this person's interesting enough. I'll write a lot of things on there and keep a record of that. It probably will not necessarily be part of what I'm writing in the final form, but it, I always have a good record. And I save these notes, so I have 60 years of notes in my great, my little, uh, not my very big uh, storage place where all my material is. Another question? Okay, don't be, no wait, I want a question from you, young lady. First of all, what's your name? 
Danielle? Okay, you promised me a question, not a speech. Okay. I noticed you didn't get, Susan didn't, you had your hand up for Susan Orlean and she didn't ask you the question. That's why I'm doing it. Um, you talked about uh, respect. Respect, uh, yes, I talked about respect. Yeah. Uh, when you interview people and you get, uh, you're talking about private life and, yes. so on, and uh, you get uh, a detail yeah. that might be, uh, I don't know if you say the you word. Get a detail picanti, that might be embarrassing? Picant, <laughs> picant, <laughs> picant, uh, like, uh, yeah, well, it might be embarrassing for that person. Yeah. Uh, if you publish it. Okay, if you publish it. So let me stop there. It's a question. How do you publish what is embarrassing? How if do you, you make the if choice? If you do that or not, if it's not necessarily for the story, yeah. would you do it or not? Well, to, uh, the, uh, the question was, when you find you get information, perhaps inadvertently or perhaps um, through, your, through your charm and they say something that might later on embarrass them if you're sensitive to them, I have found if I hear something, if somebody is feeling comfortable with me, because I said before, initially you have to cultivate people. You have to get your foot in the door. That's why being well-mannered and actually being well-attired doesn't hurt either. You, you, you get your foot in the door. You're like a salesman. I mean, all research writers and journalists, writers that, who are doing nonfiction, either at long, great length or, or shorter, still have to, to get cooperation, get your foot in the door, and it certainly helps if you, if you are, as I said before, and maybe too often, if you, if you make a, a, better, a, a, a very nice appearance, in manner and appearance. Having done that, sometimes you find, you find that people become comfortable with you, and more than that, they become candid with you. And sometimes they just want to talk. This has already been said before. You've heard this before from other people. And sometimes they open up. And then you find at the end of the day, and you review your notes, that you've learned things you never thought you would. And you've heard from people things that you never thought you would hear from these people. Then, what do you do? Well, what I do is when I feel that this is going to be a source of embarrassment, I go back to that person. I say, listen, yesterday you told me such and such. And this is what I heard. And this is what I have in my notes. Did you first of all mean that? I mean, sometimes, sometimes people say things they don't mean. And I'm sorry to say that journalism is very weak in what I'm about to charge. Journalism sometimes, particularly this time when you have tape recorders, people get things on tape that is what they said, of course, but it isn't what they mean, which is why I don't use the tape recorder, which is why I don't even make rely on, on verbatim. I don't even rely on direct quotations very much. Because what I wanted to do is, is to reflect what people mean, not what they say. And so I'll go back to them. And I say, this is either, uh, if I use this, what would, what would you think about that? So I wouldn't want you to use that. Well, you said it yesterday. But I, well, I didn't, I didn't know I said it that way. So I'll change it. I'll give you an example. Um, about Less than a year ago, a journalist from the Rolling Stone had access to a couple of generals. And McWhorter, is that the general's name? McChrystal. What is McChrystal. McChrystal. General McChrystal. Um, and, and because of it being on tape, this got in. And, and for a while, General McChrystal's career, see, now it's been revived, as you probably know. but. I thought that is the worst example of the tape recorder, where people, I mean, again, they were feeling free with this reporter. I'm imagining this, but I do think I read a, about it well enough to know that the, 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 the officers with General McChrystal and his other senior officers were traveling together. And I believe at that time, if my memory is right, there was, there was an earthquake in I, uh, Iceland or there was some event where they were volcano. volcano in was it Iceland, yeah. and they were held over for a day if I have this, and so they had time and they were, and these guys were just sounding off, and this this very uh, accurate 
and at the same time thoughtless, thoughtless, insensitive, I'll put it that way, reporter, got it down. And, and could have ruined and probably did ruin the careers of some of those other officers. What did he gain? What did that reporter from Rolling Stone get that's so wonderful? Nothing. I mean, we can't even remember what, what was said. Oh, someone said about Joe Biden, somebody, well, who cares? That kind of journalism isn't worth it. I wouldn't be part of it. I don't hear I sound like I'm such a lofty figure and castigating this guy from Rolling Stone. Maybe I am, but what do I care? I don't think it was worth it. <laughs> All right, another question. So your question was answered. Okay, sir. Wasn't there something, a peculiar sort of energy that was happening in the 60s and 70s with, with you guys, with your work, with Tom Wolfe, with Norman yeah. Mailer? And I just, you know, without, at the risk of, um, almost denigrating the new journalism, uh, I want you to sort of sing its praises, because uh, you were up to some interesting stuff. That's not really a question, but. No, I know what you're saying. He's talking about the new journalism. That's, of course, is the period when I, and Tom Wolfe, and, and, and some fiction writers, of course, uh, Norman Mailer, a principal among them, and, and Joan Didion, who writes fiction and nonfiction. And you, you know, you've probably, had teachers in school that had anthologies where a lot of these writers from the 60s when I first started are being reprinted. What do I think about it? I didn't think much about it. I felt um, my, my, uh, my c career when I did those pieces was at a time when I, I couldn't stay at the New York Times any longer because the New York Times I work for is not the New York Times that Isabel Wilkerson works, worked for or, or Jill Abramson edits. It's a, a, very, a very stodgy paper in those days. And what I, I was, loved the paper, and I, I mean, I really loved the paper then as much for the reasons I told you, that they were, they didn't lie. I mean, that I loved the idea that they were trying to be honest. That's what caught my, that's what made me love the paper. They tried to be honest. And, um, but I wanted to write longer than the paper would allow, and I wanted to take more time. And that was, it's possible now, but it wasn't, I was not born at the right time for, the, for this attitude. Esquire was then a great magazine. The New Yorker was probably a better magazine, but I was, I was not asked to write. I didn't have any access to the New Yorker. I didn't know people there, but I did know a couple people at the Esquire, and one of them was an editor named Harold Hayes. And he, I, I submitted a piece on speculation in 1960 that it published and made it, it was about my impressions of New York. I had submitted that to the New York Times Magazine, they turned it down. It was just, it was a series of impressions on New York and I went over to Esquire with it and they bought it. So I had a connection with an editor that I was now in, in favor of, they bought something, I was, did well. So I did another piece and another piece and then I, when I left the New York Times in 1965, I was 32. I had a daughter of one year. I wasn't making, I didn't have any money, but I didn't want to continue into, I've been there as a reporter in the New York Times for almost 10 years. And I wanted to take more time. And so working for a monthly magazine was more what I wanted to do than work for a daily newspaper. So I had this one year contract uh, at, at Esquire, where I was supposed to do six pieces a year for the same amount of money I'd been working, uh, making in the New York Times. This wasn't much, like 15000 a year. It sounds like it's terrible now, but in those days, it was a, it was a living income. I could pay my rent. I could, that was, it was fine. And so I did these pieces, like Frank Sinatra. I didn't want to do Frank Sinatra. I wanted to write. When I went to Esquire, I said, I'll do six pieces, but I want to get pick three of them, three ideas. And the first piece I wrote for Esquire, when I went over, left the New York Times, was to write about the New York Times guy that wrote obituaries. That's the first published piece in my 1965, uh, 1966 contract, was about an obituary writer, one of those guys that I used to know in the city room. And I just thought those characters are wonderful characters. No one, the, the word media wasn't in the, in, the, in the lexicon then. Nobody knew, no, writing about journalism was not even, nobody was doing that. They were writing biographies of great people, like I mentioned earlier, 
Paul Pulitzer or Hearst were subjects of biographers by W.A. Swanberg, but no one write about the ordinary reporter or the ordinary copy reader, certainly the ob obituary writer. So I wrote this piece called Mr. Bad News, and it was, it was a, a short story. It was accurate. I spent a lot of time. I spent a whole six weeks doing that. Mr. Bad News. And then I wanted to write about the managing editor. Because as I didn't quite clearly say to you, when I worked the New York Times, I thought that the people that I was getting to know th as fellow journalists were more interesting. I got—I asked about their personal lives. I, I wanted to know all about them, where they came from, uh, what, what their parents were like. And I was really pumping them for information, even though I never knew I'd write about them. And I, I thought they were more interesting as people than the people we were sent out to write about. I mean, you know, have to leave the New York Times and interview people. I thought the people in the New York Times were more interesting. I don't want to stay at home. In fact, I always did stay in New York for that reason. I found them more interesting. I never wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I never wanted to be a national correspondent. I wanted to stay in the home office because I liked hanging around with these people in the building. And so when I left uh, uh, to go to Esquire, I wanted to write about those people. Well, the editor said, no, you, you already, Mr. Bad News is the first. He said, you can't write about the managing editor. Do this first. Do what? Do Sinatra. I said, nobody wants to read about Sinatra. He's so overdone. He's a big celebrity. You know, who cares? Everybody knows about Sinatra. But he forced me to do it, and I went out there. The editor forced me to do it. And when I didn't get the story, uh, I, I, I didn't care that much, but I, he said, stay out there. I did stay out there, and I talked to these, all these other people. And the reason I was able to talk to all these other ordinary people who were vaguely connected to the world of Sinatra, there might be a trumpet player in some orchestra that Harry James Band, maybe, that Sinatra sang in front of 20 years before he became a star, or people that worked in lower levels of movie life that were in a, in a movie that Sinatra starred in, and the, all these ordinary people that are part of the entertainment industry, the, the music industry, the film industry. I had learned to get along with ordinary people because I was a boy in the store. I could get along with the customers. I thought the customers were interesting. I thought the reporters in my uh, New York Times home office were interesting. I was very comfortable talking to ordinary people. Because I said, I was trained that way. So when I go talk to the little lady that works for Frank Sinatra and she collects his taupe toupees, I could get her story easily. And I got that story. And I got the stories of all these supernumerary characters, all these minor characters. I was a master at the minor character subject. Because I got that from the store. And, and it sounds ridiculous, but it was useful to me. And it has remained useful to me in my whole life. So I didn't think that, 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 that a famous person had to be the story. I didn't think you have to write about newsworthy people to make news. I believe we could do as nonfiction writers, as journalists, whatever you want to call us, narrative, whatever, uh, we could write what the fiction writers did, that we could really get into the private life of ordinary people and write short stories and not change the names and not lie. And that's What's so possible and wonderful about narrative nonfiction? You don't have to lie, but you can also write deeply about people, but you have to spend the time, you have to know them. You have to put in your time. You can't shortcut. You have to do legwork, legwork, legwork. And I'm just amazed at 79, I still have the legs to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's great to be able to do, as I did on that opera singer, what I did on the other singer, Sinatra, back 40 years before. Um, so it's a great, it's a great, it's a great career for any of you have if you pursue it, because it is so, it is so special, and it's so rewarding if you do it well. One more question, okay? You it? I, I apologize about my jeans. I feel a little embarrassed about that now. I'm just not going to talk to you anymore. Jill Averson um, put the picture up of your outline. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about? what you were doing there? OK. The, um, I told you I'd make notes, and then i collect this information. i type it up. In the case of the Sinatra piece, I worked on that for 31 days. I know it was 31 days because I have 31 sections of notes, each of them dated. At the end of my research, and somebody, you know, we've already been through this, when do you know you've done enough research, and questions are answered in different ways, I just have a feeling 
when I'm hearing the same thing or thinking the same thing after having spent a lot of time in research that I better start writing. But before I can start writing, there's a, there's a difference between collecting information and writing. There's another section in there. That's called organization. And that is the most important part, I think, of the whole process. It's not you have to be able to get the information. You have to know how to do it. You have to get the door open. You have to know how to get along with the people. You have to be, have the perseverance and the patience, not rush, and you have to be fair. You have to be very fair. And my, one of the, I never won the Pulitzer, but one prize I did win, and it's not even a prize, is there's not a person I ever spoke to that wouldn't speak to me again. Never I could go back and talk to those people after the published work. And that is a prize. And but what it is, is after you've done your research, then you have to, in organizing it, you have to say, what am I going to do with this? Where is the story? What's the storyline? How do I begin? Well, when you go through the information, I make an outline to sort of invent, in, envision in a, in a visual way, what, is the, what am I describing? We're, we're storytellers. And it's as if you're a filmmaker. Here's a filmmaker with us today. And we know you have to begin in a visual way. And you have to like you go to a film. It starts somewhere. Or you read a wonderful novel or short story. Uh, it's, you have a picture. And you have to know in nonfiction, you have to think, where, where is the scene? How does it begin? So in the synopter piece, I thought, ah, the way I'm going to begin is describe that scene at night where Sinatra was at a bar. And he was not feeling good. He had a cold, but he was smoking a cigarette, I noticed. And he was with two blondes. And it was at this place in Beverly Hills. I didn't have an appointment to see him there. I happened to see him from afar. I was just one of the persons in that in that supper club called the Daisy in, in Beverly Hills. And I thought, I describe, I'll describe what he looks like. And I did have a good sense of what he looks like. I pay as a tailor's son. I paid attention to the suit. But I noticed the shoes. And I noticed the soles were were almost as if they'd, they'd, they'd been polished as well. And I remember um, uh, the shape of his, of, his, of his hands. And I remember the gold lighter. And, and I just watched him. And I kept little notes from afar. And then when he got up, he left the two women at the bar. And he got up and he walked toward what would be the pool room, those of you who read the piece. The pool room and two bodyguards, or two men went with him. And I got up and a little followed, not directly, but then I got into the pool room and it was crowded with people, so I wasn't so, I don't think I was so obviously uh, examining him or, or on his tail or in any way that call attention to myself. And that's when I heard, I watched them play pool for a while and then I heard Sinatra say something to this guy who turned out to be another pool player. And I think Jill um, Abramson mentioned his name. Um, and I listened to the dialogue and I wrote it down. And as she said, Jill Abramson, I got the name of the guy. And uh, next day I interviewed him. And, and what I wanted to know was, what was he thinking? I heard what he said. And I said, this is what I heard. Is this what, this is right, isn't it? I mean, I did, yes, but what were you thinking? Were you worried that Sinatra's going to have one of his bodyguards beat you up? Or were you worried that Sinatra's going to throw a glass in your face? I mean, you heard about, one read a lot about Sinatra's volatile personality. He could be, you know, lose his temper and behave abominably. So I got this fellow to tell me about what he thought. And that was a scene. It's a scene. Well, that cart, uh, chart we had shows you that's a scene. And I had to think. I wrote it right, right down. I sort of think about it. And then after that, what? Well, the next scene is a scene in an in a, in a, in a NBC studio where Sinatra's rehearsing and his voice cracked. Uh, so they just, I just do that in everything I write. I, so how do you begin? It's all accurate. But I think that organizational period, culminating in a, a chart, I have charts for everything like that, uh, is the way I work. It's bizarre, but it's the way I work. All uh, right, listen, I'm sorry we're not longer, but you're, you're lucky you're out of here early. Thank you. Thank you.